So good morning, everybody. Um, very, very warm welcome, as always, on this uh, rather grey Monday morning here in London. Um, it's uh, delightful to have your company. We're going to do a bit of a... Um, well, we're answering your questions that you've sent in. We've got eight questions. Uh, Sally's going to answer four of them and I'm going to answer four of them. So they're really concerns that you have with various products. And uh, we're going to do our very best to help you to get the most out of them because it's really important that you're able to do that. Uh, before I do that, um, just a little bit about Christmas, uh, as this is sort of our Christmas and uh, we've dressed up for it um, celebration uh, as well. And I've been giving some thought to what really makes the difference if you want to up your game before you um, have a special event over Christmas, whether that's uh, a party or a nice lunch that you're going to go to or some other kind of get together. And of course, Christmas Day itself. Um, and then you've got New Year. So you've got a few opportunities there. And I hope you've, you've all got uh, various opportunities for social occasions when you just really want to look a bit special and i've come to the conclusion that um, there are two absolute essentials in terms of uh, making your makeup look extra specially good and i've tried to put those into um into practice this morning when i was doing my own makeup and one of them is just time i think the thing that makes the biggest difference to how good your makeup looks is how long you spend doing it now sally and i both accept that uh, you know slapping on your makeup on an everyday basis is absolutely fine and we've both done videos where we've done it in you know we've done certain things in two minutes or five minutes or whatever in fact our most popular video is sally's five minute makeup video but the point about that is that that's because every day you really don't want to spend hours and hours and hours doing your makeup but before a special event if you spend longer than you normally would and you really do everything very precisely so my second thing is a, a, a magnifying mirror and you just keep checking in your magnifying mirror that's what i've done this morning with my makeup i've really taken time to do it properly if you ever have a makeup artist do your makeup she's probably going to take at least a half an hour possibly longer i mean wedding makeup for instance you're going, to, you're going to be in the chair for a long time. And the reason for that is that she really wants to make sure that everything about what she's applied and how she's applied, it's the best possible. So time is definitely your friend when it comes to upping your game. And then obviously choosing uh, the, the makeup you're going to put on. So what I did this morning, and again, this is a tip for you. Before I did my eye makeup, I actually put my lip makeup on, my lipstick, and I used one of our wonderful new pencils. I'm a bit of a convert. I've always hated lip pencils. <laughs> now I really quite like them. Um, and I like them the way that, that we're saying to apply them, which is doing the nice, sharp, crisp edge, filling it in like a child's drawing, and then putting uh, the lipstick on top. So today I've used raspberry, and on top of that, I've put Munro Red. So Munro Red is one of our most sort of glamorous colors, really, for a cool tone person like me. The warm toned, it's Hollywood Red. Now, I put my lipstick on first, because when I came to do my eye makeup, I wanted to balance that much brighter lip with my eyes and you can see that I haven't done a huge amount of eye makeup on my eyes I think if you then do you know really heavy smoky eye or try and do a really heavy smoky eye and you've got this right really bright red lipstick on it can look slightly overdone it could, could work for you I mean it depends your face is different from mine so um, I've just done, kept it quite simple on the eyes I've used pewter gray which is a favorite color of mine along the lash line I've used um, charcoal and I've also touched in a little bit of our, our I'd say, lovely new eye pencils in the grey. And then I put two coats of mascara on curled eyelashes. So I feel that that's done quite good, a, a quite a good job at balancing. And then in terms of what I'm wearing, Sally will tell you what she's wearing. So can you see that my my top, which is actually just a very fine wool jumper, has got sort of glitzy bits in it. So it's not, you know, massively sparkly, but you can see that it's got these these glittery bits in it. I bought it from Whistles. I've actually got three of these. I've got a grey one, I've got a navy blue one, and I've just bought this black one. Uh, I think they're brilliant. And I think they're brilliant because they are really, really fine. You can wear them underneath things and they're comfortable to wear. And they do make make even just a jumper and you want to be a little bit warmer a bit special and then around my neck I've had this collar thing for about I don't know four or five years I bought it from Jigsaw I think 
I think it was jigsaw. Um, and it's obviously, you know, great big paste stuff that glitters and glints. And then I've got these earrings um, to go with it. So I brightened the whole thing up and made the whole thing more glamorous with the addition of my uh, my rather over the top jewellery. So if I was going to an evening event rather than sitting here on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock, um, hopefully I would look uh, festive and, uh, and appropriate. And of course my makeup needs to balance uh, what I'm doing here and here. And this is very OTT. So if this is very blingy and OTT, then obviously your makeup just needs to look really refined and quite professional. And you'll only get that if you use a uh, time give yourself time and space to do it. And also uh, a nice big magnifying mirror so that you can check and double check that it looks really fantastic. So I hope that was helpful. Um, we're going to question number one now, which is, um, let me get this one. Yes, it's actually uh, a question from Caroline. So I'm gonna pass over to Sally for this. So I'll let Sally read the question out to you and then she might like to just go through what she's wearing and how she's done her makeup this morning because hopefully you'll be interested in that. Thank you very much, Tricia. Good morning, everybody. Um, just, just before I read the question, I just wanted to say, I absolutely agree with everything Tricia says. And I also love, I actually like to put the radio on and enjoy the radio while I'm putting my makeup on um, uh, and sort of have the time to do it. One extra thing I would do if I was going to a party the next day is the night before, um, I would use ideally the um, gentle face exfoliator because I always feel that my makeup goes on so much better the next day if I've used an exfoliator. Um, and I might also use a hydrating clay mask after the exfoliator to really give my skin a bit of a boost before that special day. So really, really good to use those two products too. Um, I am uber glitzy this morning um as i said my neighbor came around with a, an amazon parcel for me and she's a fairly new neighbor and, and i sort of had to explain that i don't normally dress like this on a monday morning as i took my parcel in from her um so i am wearing um the warm brown trio and the dark brown eyeliner with the chocolate over the top um so i've got um cream i've got cocoa in my socket line and an extra bit of cocoa over the uh, of chocolate over the top just to define a little bit. Um, like Trisha, I have curled my eyelashes and I've used a couple of coats of um, the black um, mascara. And I've got um, strawberry. I also love the eyeliners and lip liners. And I've got the strawberry um, warm toned lip liner all over and poppy. And then I've got some lip gloss in the center, just the clear shine lip gloss in the center. Um, I'm using peach cream blush, a little bit of bronzer, and I've got continuous cover foundation number two with a little bit of light look beauty balm number one. So with no further ado, let me talk about the first question from Caroline. So Caroline says, do you have any tips for preventing a smoky eye look ending up as a panda look um, by the end of the day evening? No matter what I do, be it placing primer below the eye, not wearing mascara on my lower lashes and a light powdering, it always manages to transfer. Um, it's a really, really good question, something that we, we do get asked. Um, so Caroline, first of all, I would certainly agree with Trisha for using a, a really good magnifying mirror. I would always, always, um, if I'm trying to do a smoky eye, make sure that you do use your face prime foundation, concealer under the eye and light powdering, which is obviously what you do. Um, I'm not sure whether you are using the um, eye prime, but definitely using the smooth out eye prime on, I don't tend to use, I know some people do use it underneath. I tend to just use it literally on the lid area and on this area. Um, I find that using the concealer underneath is enough to stop transferring, but you know, that, that, that's up to, I know some people do use it underneath the eye as well. Um, blending that well and not using too much of the, um, the, the lid, the eye prime. Um, and when you put it on, make sure that your eye is, is sort of dry and oil free. Now, when you're actually, if you're doing a smoky eye, you might well be putting a little bit heavier makeup on. You might be using the, the charcoal or depending on whether you're warm or cooler um, or the warms. So, there are two things you can do to help 
protect because often what happens is you get a little bit of transfer as you're actually doing the application that you might not necessarily see um, so you can either some people like to hold up just a cotton pad like this when you are putting on your darker colors or what I sometimes do is to put a little bit of translucent powder using a cotton um, ball just here and here before I do that that part of my eye makeup and then at the end I just dust it away with a big powder brush so you might find that actually what some of the transference is starting earlier in the day so really 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 make sure when you've done it that you clean up everything as Trisha said earlier using a cotton bud um, so that there's no little specks um, to, to transfer um, the other thing that you might find, because it does depend on the shape of your eyes as well, as to some people just whatever they do get a little bit of transference. And for that, I would suggest at the end of your makeup, you go one step further and use a setting spray. So I like the Urban Decay All Nighter one. Um, I also like Model in a Bottle. That's another good one, Model in a Bottle. So when you've done your whole makeup, um, and you, if you do find you get transference, if you just close your eyes and hold it about 20, about 20 centimetres, 30 centimetres away and spray all over, just let it dry and then open. You might find that also helps with transference. And obviously, if you're using mascara, do use the waterproof one rather than the other one. Um, Finally, you might be somebody that actually doesn't realize that you touch your face quite a lot and touch your eyes. So that's tricky to know whether you do that. But obviously, you know, the more we fiddle with our eyes, the more likely you are going to get a little bit of transference. So difficult problem, but hopefully some of those ideas will help a little bit. If you've got anything else, Trisha, or whether we want to move on to the next one. Uh, no, I haven't got anything to add. I, th I think people's faces alter, um, differ in terms of the shape. And when, yeah. I mean, what people will say, will often say things like, oh, I find I put my mascara on and the next thing I know I've got, you know, and I think, well, how does that, <laughs> how does that happen? That has never happened to me in my life. And it's like, is there something to do with the, the sort of bone structure that you've got around your eyes that means that when you blink, somehow your 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 eyelashes are touching so maybe this is higher or something um but obviously waterproof mascara is a good idea for that and uh and and curling your eyelashes might help because you're going to push them up and away and so on so i think it's about finding something that's going to work for you um and i i think the setting spray idea is really excellent because that that is actually what it's designed to do that it's it's literally just sets i i personally wouldn't use anything like that perhaps every day but for special yeah. occasions uh, special occasion weddings you know long days which are likely to be quite emotional a bit of crying a bit of laughing hopefully um that kind of thing it, it could uh it could make all the difference to how good your makeup looks um, on an occasion like that you know an occasion that goes on for hours and hours and hours and hours perhaps in different temperatures and you know very hot day and so on not this time of the year here anyway okay so my next question comes from uh let me see where judy i don't know if judy is on this call but she's asked a very important question about foundation and pilling now for those of you who don't know what pilling is you know you get you can you get it on a jumper so if sometimes if you've got um particularly cashmere jumpers you've um you rub the sleeve to the you know to the side of your body and it comes up in these little little uh, balls um i've got a trick for that actually if you're interested i'll give you one of my one of my tips for that i just <laughs> this is going to sound horrific i discovered a few months ago that if i took a a razor so a lady safety razor and i just combed i just I just combed it over the pills on my jumper along here and down the side and anywhere else. The pills came off and the jumper was completely un, uh, you know, un, untouched, you know, wasn't hurt, damaged. That's what I'm trying to say, damaged by the razor. And it's brilliant because it brings any of those really badly pilled uh, jumpers back to life almost instantly. It takes a while, you have to be quite careful, but just you know, using a razor, you can get them off. Anyway, pilling on the face, slightly, slightly different. You don't need a razor for that. So what is pilling on the face? So it's um, when you're going to put your foundation on 
And as you are rubbing it in, either with a brush or with your fingers, your it starts to form little clumpy balls. And it's really quite horrifying and a bit disgusting and also worrying because you think, oh my God, it's not sticking to my skin. Now, there are several reasons why this might be happening. So you have to find out which is your problem. And when I get to the problem, because I get it sometimes, I'll tell you when I get when I get to that that bit of it, why I get it there. So um, I've made a list of these and I'm just going to go through them in turn. So the first thing is rushing your regime. So what you have to understand is that skin, which is the surface onto which you're going to put all the products that you uh, that you use, skincare and makeup, can only absorb at a certain rate. And skins vary as to how quickly they can absorb different layers of product. If your skin is fairly dry, it will probably absorb the product quicker than if it's uh, oily or greasy or you know not dry. So you have to remember that if you're going to put several different layers of product on your skin, you, you have to be patient enough to allow them all to be absorbed by your skin so that it's ready for the next layer. Except I would say for the hydration hold serum and the day moisturizer that we have, I like to put my uh, moisturizer, my daytime moisturizer on quite quickly after I put my hydration and hold serum on. The reason for that is that I feel that the hyaluronic acid in the hydration and hold serum actually wants that cream to go on quite quickly. And it feels like that's the best way to get the, the effect that I want because that hydration hold serum then takes that day cream in and all the moisture that's in it. Remember, it's a moisturizer, it's there to add water. So, uh, water and, and the various other good goodies that's in it, vitamins and so on and so forth. So by putting quite quickly after you've applied your hydration whole serum, your, your moisturizer on, you'll find that will work really, really well and it will look great. It's next that you've got to leave some time. So my routine in the morning is to, is to wash my face. So I, I cleanse my face by finally washing it. So that's with warm water and a flannel very, very thoroughly so that my skin is really clean and really dry, dry from patting them, you know, with a, with a towel. Then I put the hydration whole serum on, then I put the moisturizer on. Now I do that first before I do anything else. So after that, I will, uh, you know, I will get ready for the, for the day pretty much to the point where I'm washed, dressed, I've done my uh, hair, everything's done. And at that point, I will sit down to do my makeup. So I'm leaving a pretty, I'm, I'm leaving a good 10 to 15 minutes really between one thing and the other. I do not put my moisturizer on immediately go to put my makeup on. So I'm giving my skin long enough to uh, absorb that initial uh, moisture uh, from the moisturizer in the hydration whole serum. Um, I then apply the foundation. Now, one of the things that we also suggest that you know really works well is primer, and primer is one of those essential ingredient uh, parts of your makeup which holds the makeup in place for longer and makes your skin look smoother. Now the problem with the primer is that it contains something called silicon. Now silicon is what gives it the lovely smoothness that you can feel on your skin. We call it smooth like silk. That is literally being applied to your skin and it's beautiful because it makes your skin feel really, really smooth, which is really excellent because your foundation looks so much better. It also holds the product, the foundation that you apply better for longer. But the trouble with certain foundations, not ours because they're formulated to go together, is that the two interact in a way that you know doesn't work terribly well. So you get this problem of the ingredients not, not uh, uh, working together um, effectively, and in fact, this is one of the other points that um, I need to uh, I need to come to. So we've talked about time and rushing the regime. So one of the other problems is that ingredients are reacting to each other. So remember that everything you put on your face, the hyaluronic acid uh, serum, the um, rich serum, the moisturizer, the primer and the uh, foundation, any or all of those might not like each other. So if you're using different products from different brands, I know a lot of people, uh, women, wear um, the Protect and Perfect, I think it's called the Boots one. It's 
you know, it's got really good um, reviews. It's been very well reviews, reviewed and so on and so forth. It's obviously an extremely good product. It does not like our foundation. So there is something in that that doesn't work with our with an ingredient or ingredients in our foundation. So if you're using that and you're getting pilling, it's because you've got that moisturizer. Now you've got a choice. You either change to our moisturizer or you have a different foundation. You can't use our foundation with it if you're finding that it pills. It's not a problem that can be solved. By the way, people will put comments on super troops and they'll say things like, oh, your foundation pills. Well, actually, the foundation itself doesn't pill. I can put that foundation on the back of my hand, uh, you know, clean, dry surface, nothing else on it. And there's, it won't pill. It's pilling in reaction and in relationship to the other products that you're putting on. You have to find which is the culprit, change it, if you want to keep using our foundation. So just, just be a bit aware of that. It could be a bit hit and miss and a bit sort of experimental. But every single one of our products, that's the, um, the hydronic acid, the moist, uh, rich serum, the moisturizer, the primer, and the foundation are designed to work together. I wear them every day and you know my makeup is fine, except for one area, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, what was I gonna say? I was going to say something really important uh that's gone out of my head um yeah i, I it'll come back and i'll uh, i'll come back to it so that's the that's the second reason ingredients are not liking each other and it's causing this pilling um yeah so the third thing is too much product so this is an interesting one. I think with moisturizer, we're all very conscious that skin, skins really need nourishment at our age. There is something about putting some lovely moisturizer on that really makes your skin feel sort of uh, happy. So the thing about that is that you can tend to be quite heavy handed with it. I know I am sometimes. And I just sort of, you know, put great dots of it, you know, like, like blocks of it almost, and then rub it in. And I then leave a long time before I put my makeup on. But I read a tip the other day and it said, go uh, work on the basis of 13 dots. <laughs> so you put, you put your moisturizer on. So you've got four on this cheek, four on this cheek. That's eight. Uh, did I say 13? Um, I think I've got my maths wrong. <laughs> Okay, that's eight, eight. Um, two on the chin, that's ten. Yeah, three on the forehead. Yeah, three, four, four, two. So dot, 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 all over, and then rub that in. Don't put any more on. So that will be enough. I then add, would add a bit of extra for my neck because I like to put moisturizer on my neck every day. So try and keep the product quite fine rather than really slathering it on. Uh, you can put more on at night because you've got all night for that to absorb and you're not trying to put makeup on top. But certainly for daytime moisturizer, don't put too much product on. And I'd say with the foundation this morning, what I did was to keep it really fine. So to start with relatively small amount of my mixture on my hand and just get that on, smooth it in and then look again and think, mm, might need a bit more here, here, here. Add a little bit where you need it. So the whole thing is it doesn't have to be thick just you know quite a refined amount so that's the that's the third reason why you'll have a problem with pilling too much product the fourth reason is um applying skincare in the wrong order so i don't wear an spf um and there, i mean look I understand why people do want to wear an SPF. They've been told to wear an SPF. They perhaps, I've had a basal cell carcinoma on my nose, a very superficial one, which was actually removed almost with a biopsy. I've had a much more serious one up here on my hairline. My mother died of melanoma. My brother has had an ocular melanoma, which is a horrendous thing, which was basically a mole behind his eye, he had a cancer on it which he had cured by um, an amazing treatment. So we're a family that's moly. I'm very moly, you can see. And we're a family prone to uh, skin uh, damage from the sun. So you'd think I'd be the first person to be wearing an SPF. And I don't because I uh, am 
very, very careful in proper full sunlight. I hats and stay in the shade, never sunbathe my face ever, haven't done for years and years and years. And also our moisturizer does has a, have SPF in it. It's not a massively high factor, but it does have SPF in it. And then by the time I put on the hyaluronic acid, the uh, serum, the moisturizer, and then the foundation that I wear, I feel that there is already there a pretty good um, amount of protection. And I don't like the effect on my skin of a high SPF. Uh, it, they've often got titanium oxide in them, which is quite a whitening thing. And uh, anyway, that's me. And I I do get checked. I'm, I'm under a dermatology clinic. I get checked a lot. So I'm very conscious and I'm very careful. Uh, but uh, make sure that you apply your skincare in the right order. I think the rule is with SPF is you put that on last. So you put on serum, then moisturizer, then SPF, allow that to thoroughly absorb. And then on top of that, you start your makeup. Um, the, fifth, uh, the fifth one I've got down here, I think I'm up to number five, is um, make sure that you don't rub in your skincare patted in. So you're not doing this because if you it, you get the pilling when you start rubbing anything, skincare or makeup. So you're rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it. As you're rubbing it, it's kind of rubbing into these little um, pill effects. So just dotting and so on. And so forth. I'd say smoothing, smoothing and rubbing is different. So that's that one. And the final one, which is where I get a problem, is you, you need to exfoliate. Your skin, if it has dry, uh, dead skin cells on the surface, will pill with the makeup or the skincare that you put on because basically the skin the skin cells are coming off as you're, as you're, uh, putting, as you're applying the skincare. Now, I get this when I'm being a bit lazy and I haven't done enough exfoliation. I get it on my jawline here. So face is fine, no pilling, great, looks looks wonderful, looks lovely and smooth. And I get down here and I start to do that thing of taking it down over my jawline like that. And as I do, up come the little bumps, the little pills of a uh, thing. And it's because my neck hasn't been exfoliated. I get it around the hairline as well sometimes, right up on the hairline. So the, the pilling happens. Now, if that happens, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. I just get a big fat brush and I just do that and they disappear. Uh, and you can do that to get rid of pilling anyway. So if you do get pilling, you'll still have product on your face. It still will have been absorbed and you just need to smooth it and, and, and rub it away like that. But people get a bit um, angsty about it. They get worried about it because they think, oh, it doesn't look very nice. Well, it doesn't, but you can get rid of it and it's not the end of the world. And I've given you all the explanations for why it might be happening. So I hope that was helpful. That was a very long uh, explanation, but uh, there's a lot to tell you. So I'm going to hand back to uh, Sally. Uh, oh no, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's me again. Okay, next question is to do with um, not having it in the eyebrows. I have no eyebrows. Um, I haven't actually got the full question written out here, but um, the, the, the problem is no eyebrows. So let's talk about eyebrows a bit. It, this is really difficult. Um, Bryony, are you able to show, I've got a picture of my sister-in-law, Jenny, who um, was the person for whom I devised our brow shape. Just, if you show her before picture, please. Um, I've got them side by side, so I can show I them both. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, one, absolutely. One okay, so this is my lovely sister-in-law, Jenny. Uh, this picture was taken uh, when I was in the process of putting the business together, Look Fabulous Forever together. And I desperately wanted to cure Jenny's considerable problem that she'd lost her eyebrows. So you can see in the first picture, she has absolutely no eyebrows. And the effect of that on a face is, is quite dramatic. This is a very good illustration of why eyebrows matter. And the fact that um, you haven't got eyebrows means that you've got this big expanse of skin above your eyes, which of course we normally see on a, you know, on a face with eyebrows, we normally see that broken down. So she's got this very, very long uh, bit going up to her hairline. And um, everything about her face is, is sort of unbalanced by the fact that she's got no eyebrows. By the way, she lost her eyebrows because of a, a thyroid uh, problem that she had. Didn't lose her eyelashes and didn't lose her hair, but she did lose her, what she had had is really quite, um, you know, good eyebrows before. So you look at Jenny afterwards. And what I was doing in this picture was I was experimenting with the idea of putting on some very subtle color 
I didn't want to put heavy eyebrows back onto Jenny's face because for a start, she's got, um, you know, she's got sort of, uh, she has highlights put into her, her hair. And I wanted to put something back that was subtle, but at the same time, just gave her that shaping that she needed. And I think you'll, you'll agree with me. I know she's got eye makeup in the second one. I, I always, she's got hooded eyes, can you see? And I was also doing a sort of an anti-hooded eye makeup on her in the second picture. So I put quite a subtle um, uh, lips, lip color on her as well. But I think you'll agree that the second picture is quite dramatically better than the first picture where I've done a bit of correcting with the um, the hooded eye and also put in these quite subtle eyebrows. Now, in the process of doing this, um, Jenny had been using a, a pencil and she'd been drawing sort of very simple arcs, uh, a bit like a child's drawing, and it didn't didn't work very well at all. It didn't look right, and she was very self conscious about it. So I suddenly had this idea that perhaps we needed something, a different approach, and that what a painter would do if they were painting a portrait would be to fill in the eyebrows as tiny, fine hairs, you know, which is what your eyebrows are. They're tiny, fine hairs that are going in a particular direction and are in a particular position on your face. So um, keep that in mind as I go through. We can perhaps take that picture off now, please. Uh, thank you. So um, we've got, by the way, we've got a video about this. We'll put that underneath the recording for this uh, for this pro this program. Um, and you might look at it. It's uh, one that Sally did on one of our super troops called Helen. I think that's right, Sally? Yes, yes, yes. that's right. OK, she had an eyebrow problem. OK, so uh, solving the problem of no eyebrows. So I've done a drawing here. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. But basically, hold it up the right way, we have eyes, we have the edge of our nose, which is very useful for giving us pointers. And then we have our, our hairline at the side. And we have, to, we have to decide where our eyebrows are going to go if we've, got, if we've got none. And you can see that I've put three dots. So I put one dot, which is roughly uh, level at the, with the edge of the nose. Um, the eye might be a different position to that, but it's the edge of the nose. I'll, I'll show you this in a minute. Then you've got the where the end of the eyebrow needs to go, and that's at, at an angle. If you if you look, I don't know how to do this. This angle here is going to come down here, and then you've got something that will go through the middle of the eye, the pupil of the eye, to form the arc, the top of the arc. Okay, so this is very straightforward. So I can do it here. So edge of the nose, that's where the, where your eyebrows start angle going that way, edge of the nose out to the eye, outer eye, that's where your eyebrow is going to finish. And then up through the middle of the eye to, from the edge of the nose is where you get the highest point. And most eyebrows are shaped, not straight, not rounded, but actually they, they, they're they thicker here, they build up and then they come back down, they taper away to a point. That's a sort of like a classic eyebrow shape. Now you can buy eyebrow stencils so these are plastic things that have got different shapes of eyebrows cut out of them and you put them onto your face here and you've literally got the outline of the eyebrow that you can then uh, potentially use. I've never used one. I'm not sure how easy they are, but you can get them. And if you are desperate, you could try and you might find that they will help you because what, what's challenging is where to put, put your eyebrows between here and here. So, you know, they're going to go there somewhere. And I was talking to Sally about this. Maybe the best thing is to is to get a good photograph of yourself when you had eyebrows. Mm -hmm. um, if you've you know if, you, if you've had eyebrows in in sometime in your life, get a good photograph of yourself, blow it up, and really look at where your eyebrows sit. So where do they sit in relationship to your hairline and your the top of your you know say your eye socket here. And then, of course, when you've positioned it, your three dots which you've which you've got from this so dot poke myself in, my eye, in the eye, dot here, dot there, dot there, is that using our magic little uh, tool here of liquid paint and, um, I don't know how to show you to, how to do this, I'm doing it back to front on a screen, it's really difficult. Anyway, I'll start to sort of do the stroking motion and try and keep it as realistic as I can. So I'm literally, stroking this on so if I've got it here on my eyes I'm doing this this is very different doing the screen because I'm back to front and upside down all sorts of things but you're basically stroking between those three points in order to create 
as light and feathery and genuinely realistic effect as you possibly can. So I'm going to stop there because it it's just, you know, I can't demonstrate it on somebody's, but we have a film for you to look at. Think in terms of the three dots. And for people who've got eyebrows, this is also useful because I've got eyebrows, but they run out so that they disappear from um, from about here. I've really only got brow hair now here. So mine are too short. So what I do is obviously make them longer using the brow shape. And also I fill in any gaps I've got. So I, I ruthlessly pluck out my long, weird, wire, wiry eyebrows and the ones that are white. Um, I pluck those out and then I replace them with a little bit of brow shape. And I, th I find it's absolutely brilliant, our brow shape. I, if I say so myself, given that I came up with the idea. <laughs> I think it works really well. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. And um, as I said, always use your um, a straight a straight line to get where the where the points need to be. And actually, if you get the brows in the right the right shape and the right length and so on, they'll be the most flattering that you can have for your for your eyes and for your face. Uh, it's really important. So I'm going to hand over to Sally, who's going to do our fourth question. Thank you, Tricia. Brilliant. Um, so the fourth question comes from Rosie, who says, I struggle with a swollen face due to medication. How can I contour or shade my face so it looks slimmer using highlighter and bronze? So first of all, I just want to say, so, I'm so sorry to hear this, Rosie. I think it can be so distressing when you're taking medication and it puffs you up or changes your skin um, and you know you feel kind of out of control so really sorry to hear this um, you can definitely use bronzer and highlighter to help um, but don't go mad I would say um, everything with a very light touch um, our uh, we've actually I think we have also done a, a video that Bryony might have on using bronzer um, as a as a contour powder what's the difference between contouring and blusher it all gets very confusing but our bronzer is um, it looks really scary but it's not it's a matte bronzer that actually you can use as a contour powder so contouring is where you are pushing something back to create a shadow and the instant bright highlighter is, I call it my magic pen, is where you can highlight something to bring it forward. So what I would say to Rosie is you could very gently use the bronzer. I tend to like to use it in a sort of a three shape just to create a little bit of shading here and particularly on your jawline. It would just, if you put a tiny bit on your jawline, it makes your jawline look a bit sharper, which can have the effect of slimming. Um, and also, um, you can, you can put a little bit under your nose. I like to put a tiny bit there as well. Um, I use the highlighter, you can use the highlighter. I don't know if you can see, I've used the highlighter pen, a strip down the center of my nose, it makes my nose look slimmer because it brings that forward. And I always put a little bit just in a sort of C here and here, which will have the effect of bringing my cheekbones out, which, which can help your face. If your face is looking rounder, it just changes because as you're moving, it changes with the light. So, Definitely doing that can help. But I wanted to say other things are really important. Um, you can think about your hairstyle. So if you've got a very round face, um, what you don't want is to have um, a, a hairstyle that is very round and sort of a very small fringe, which will have the effect of, of actually sort of closing in your face so if anything maybe think about I don't know if it's possible but see how whether your hair can maybe grow a little bit longer or have it sort of shaped a little bit around your face which can slim the face and maybe have a, a fringe that's not down if you're wearing a fringe maybe have it more to the side which can also have the effect of elongating um, you can also wear longer length earrings rather than big wide earrings, which will have the effect of widening your face. So sort of longer earrings and you can distract away by really working hard on your eye makeup and your lips and maybe wearing lovely, um, a lovely necklace, slightly like longer necklace or a scarf and the right colours for you. So I think there are other things that you can do other than Contour, contouring and highlighting, yes, but don't go mad is my, my advice on that one. Um, and maybe really make sure your foundation is good as well to have a really lovely base to do that with. So I hope that that helps um, for question four. So let's go back to 
Tricia, I think for question five with Helen. Uh, yes, so Helen asked, um, should you put foundation on your eyes? Uh, so when you're when you're applying your foundation, you've obviously got this whole eye area here. Do you then smooth some of that foundation over your eyes? Um, I would say no, not. Uh, although I do when I'm put it when I'm putting my foundation on, I might just equalize the skin tone on that bit, but then I'm going to put highlighter on top. But because this bit will will then might then look a completely different color from the rest of my face, although, you know, I mean, I'm not changing the color that much. But obviously, if I'm putting a little bit of foundation on warmed up with a bit of um, beauty balm, which uh, I do, then this bit might look a bit more sort of bluey or gray, almost tone uh, compared to the rest. So I will sweep it over there. Now, if I so just on the top bit, but not on the eyelid. I'd say not on the eyelid because the eyelid, you're going to want that as dry as you possibly can, as free of oil as you possibly can. And also then you're going to put some um, eye primer on it. And the effect of the eye primer is to neutralize the color because it is, um, you know, it, it does cover cover any discoloration and neutralize any um, uh, discoloration that you've got. Uh, now, when, just, just a tip there, if you do, sweep the brush, the foundation brush over and, and include this brow bone bit. Some of it will gather in your eyebrows. And if you get a magnified mirror and go in close, you'll find that your eyebrows can actually, you can really see that that product has settled and nestled into, uh, been caught by your brow hairs. So what I do, I always, I, I sort of, after I put my foundation on, I take a Q-tip and I rub that Q-tip into the uh, skin of my eyebrows and also take my spoolie brush and, and then brush it out so that I get rid of any accumulated product that's settled into my brows. I also take that Q-tip and go around and check all every, every other bit, so my hairline and so on, and I'm rubbing it off where it's, because you're pushing the product to the outer edge, it can accumulate in there. I do my top lip as well, because again, it gathers, you know, that top lip is a bit fuzzy, a bit hairy. I mean, it's not, I haven't got moustache or anything yet, but um, just taking a Q-tip and just rubbing it around their edges of hairline into the um, brow hairs just removes any residue, um, which I think is the best way to deal with it. But so that's my answer to you. Yes, you can nor, um, even the skin tone all over, including this bit here, but not on the eyelids. And then when you come to put your, um, High, highlighter on your instant bright highlighter you can dot it on there and it is like it is here it's going on top of foundation so you're dotting it around there so i hope that answered your question helen and i think the next person is going to be uh sally who's going to talk about trudy's problem yes Thank you, Tricia. Um, Trudy says, I have terrible under eye dark shadows. I have looked on your website and I think that I need both the neutralizer and the concealer. How do I apply help? That's a really good question. We have a lot of people are not sure how to do, how to use the color balance. What Judy's talking about is our color balance neutralizer, this product in peach. We have two color balance neutralizers. This is a peach one and this is the green one. So the green one is if you've got redness, really bad, maybe broken capillaries or rosacea and, and re really, or you just blush a lot and don't want to. And the peach one is for um, really, really dark circles or if you've got um, sort of dark um, pigmentation from sun age spots that you really feel needs that bit of extra help. So let me explain. I thought I'd do it on my hands. So the order in which I do it um, is to always to use, I've already done this. I put the smooth like silk face prime on first. Um, so I've already done that earlier because um, just to save a bit of time, put that on. Then the next product I would use, say I'm doing my dark circles and they're really dark. I would at that point put the color balance neutralizer in peach on and I would literally dot it onto where the darkness is so just pretend I've got something there so let's 
it is difficult doing this, Trisha. You're absolutely right. Doing it on the on the screen. So, so I'll put it on that one there. You put it on. You can see it is a real peachy kind of colour, but it can you see that? Um, so it, it what that does is it counteracts sort of brown and purpley colours underneath the eye. So it comes with an applicator. So what I would probably do is literally put it on with the applicator and either just use my ring finger to tap it in or my concealer brush number four, this one. I find that one a really good one too, the concealer brush to really just or tap it in. Um, on larger areas, that I'm using it on, I tend to use, I do tend to use this brush a lot actually. On smaller areas, if I'm trying to just do little tiny bits of application, I will use the um, eyeshadow stroke lip brush number five, the smaller one. So you do that next. Um, what I then do is to use my foundation or my light look beauty balm. And obviously, if you've used this product on your on some sort of sunspots, age spots, as well as the dark circles, when you're putting your foundation on, you need to use a different application. You can't just drag it all on. So what I would do is to stipple it on. So if I just take, I'll take a little bit on another part of my hand, because that's what I, I tend to use my hand as my, um, my hand as my palette, just get my foundation brush. So foundation brush. So if I take a little bit of product and the effect is, is I kind of do it like that rather than dragging it. So I would do that, I would stipple it around the eye and particularly if I put it on, if I'm using the green to counteract redness, you don't want to just drag your foundation on because that will drag the green into areas you don't want it. Or if you've used the peach on certain areas, you don't want to drag that all over. So I put that on and you can see it that the foundation has gone on beautifully. Um, and what I then do, because that won't have completely got rid of the dark circles, I then take my concealer. Um, so the cover to cover concealer, which is beautiful and creamy, and I would go over again using, I love the concealer brush for this. Um, and I would again sort of stipple it into the areas where I have already applied the peach um, corrector. Now, do you put, question is, do you bring your foundation right up to the eyes? You don't need to put a lot under the eyes. I would probably with my foundation brush just sort of do that. And so there's a little bit under there, but not not loads. If I, you know, you don't want too many thick, thick layers, but it is a layering process. And the concealer will just go over and finish, should finish off the job of getting rid of the dark circles. And then finally, particularly if I have used the green or use it in other areas, I am a great believer in just a little bit of our beautiful translucent powder to set that. Um, so I use a, just a, a small sweep of that just under the eyes just to hold everything in place or certainly if I have used it on an area um, here I will just sometimes press and roll it in to an area that I've con concealed and then dust off the excess with my big fat powder brush. So I hope that helps with that with that question. And I think the next one is um, for Trisha. So it is home. yes. Yeah, and, and Sally's reiterating something that I've been saying um, earlier, you know, the way you apply, so patting, pressing, rather than dragging and rubbing, um, you know, it, if, if you give the makeup the chance to work in the way that it needs to, and that neutralizer, because you put it on first, it needs to be allowed to stay put <laughs> because if you drag it off or you start mixing it in with the other product, you get it where you don't want it to be. And also it doesn't actually look too good. I think you have to really practice at doing that so that, that you get the effect that you want, which is to um, to neutralize the discoloration that you've got. And it works brilliantly if you, if you apply it to, uh, in the way that Sally's just told you. Now, my question is for, uh, answers for Joan. And she's asked us about the Root Boost Spray. Um, so here it is, our Root Boost Spray. This is one of the best things that we sell. I think <laughs> that's a huge claim. Everything we sell is absolutely brilliant. But I was so thrilled when we uh, decided that we would uh, create a hair care range. 
And for me, the key thing for older hair is to get it to look as thick and as luscious and as, you know, thick hair is really uh, something that um, we associate with, with youth and uh, health. Uh, so having thicker looking hair anyway can be achieved very successfully with products especially the right product. So um, I, I have been, as I said, thrilled. Now, when I was testing this one, I loved it so much that when my bottle ran out, I was heartbroken because we weren't going to actually have it on the shelves for about six months. It takes quite a long time to develop product and get it on the shelves. And I had to make do without, which was, uh, which was really difficult because I was using other products. So it just wasn't as good. So why this is better for me than any of the other ones that I used to use is that it's completely non-sticky. Um, doesn't leave that sort of residue but it really works to lift your hair now I've got very very flat hair so getting any kind of lift into my hair is very very difficult so using the root boost spray you can use it um, two or three ways the first way that you use it is on wet hair when you've just washed your hair your hair is really wet there's a film of me doing this um, a film of me drying my own hair and I show you how I get the lift how I get the volume into it again Brian can put that at the bottom of the, the video for this but basically it's a it's a fine spray and I will just lift my hair my wet hair and I just spray it very very liberally I'm really really quite heavy-handed with it I'll spray it onto the, my scalp. I'll also spray it onto my hair. So I, I've actually put quite a liberal spraying of this all over. I then use my trusty, it's a bit manky this brush, I've had it for years. I've got six of these, as you know. So these are my, these are my, my roller brushes that have got a handle on them. So the handle comes off and I can leave the roller in there. So I can go section by section by section. And as I go along, I'm putting the handle in using, using the handle with my, my hair dryer. And as I do that, this is the other way I use it, I will lift this and spray along the root. So I will literally spray it into the root as I'm blowing dry. So then I blast the root with a bit of heat from the hair dryer along the roller and then curl the roll around and then take the handle out. So I've, I've left, I do this particularly on top, on this top bit. So I've left this sort of panel down here of three or four of these rollers. And then I, I tend to do this the wrong way around. I can't do it, it's back to front. Anyway, so I do the front bit separately. Um, and by using the root boost spray all over and into the roots initially on wet hair, and then using it into the roots specifically around those rollers that I'm um, putting in to dry my hair, um, it really works brilliantly. So when I pull those rollers out, my hair goes ping, and it kind of bounces up and it's a delight to my heart because I tell you what, my, my hair is so flat and it, it's, it's flat to the point where I, I get depressed looking at it. So anything that lifts the roots and actually gives it that bounce and volume really, really helps. The third way you can use it is on dry hair. So if you need a little bit of a, an oomph to your hair because you're just about to go out or you've been out in the rain or you've um, been wearing a hat or something as push your hair down flat again, you can lift it back up by just lifting again, lift the, uh, your hair, spray into the roots, maybe a little bit of heat from a hair dryer will help you dry, dry off the root boost spray, although it dries very quickly. And then you can leave it and it looks uh, all lovely and restored to bounce health and gorgeousness again. So um, as I said, I think it's one of the best products we have. I'm, I'm also using, I tend to use, um, a sort of mixture of shampoos because I like to put um, a coloured shampoo on. We're asking our uh, people who are supplying our shampoo and conditioner and uh, root boost spray if they would do us a, a nice um, one for grey hair, grey white hair, uh, hair like mine that's sort of a bit of a mixture of grey and, and, and lighter bits. And I have highlights put in the front um, because I would like to get it right down to ash. I hate yellow. Um, and they have said they'll think about it, but it really messes up the vats that they cook the stuff in. <laughs> vats go purple, apparently. So they're a bit reluctant to make it for us. That sounds like we've got some kind of witch's cauldron uh, sort of in a room <laughs> creating, creating this product for us. It's not quite like that. But um, anyway, we're trying to persuade them that they really want to make this for us and uh, fingers crossed they will. But I do use our conditioner and I use the conditioner because I really feel that makes a huge difference to the um, 
to the volume of my hair and then the root whisperer. So Joan, I really hope that helped you. Um, and I, I don't think you can use too much I, because it doesn't weight your hair down and it also doesn't um, make it sticky. It still keeps your hair nice and light and um, well, bouncy which is lovely. Um, so that's Joan. And I think we're on our last question now, which is uh, to Sally for the last one. Thank you, Tricia. Um, yes, I love using it as well, the root boost, and I use it on dry hair a lot, as well as on wet hair. So Lynn um, is question number eight. What are your thoughts on matte lipstick for an older face? Um, it's a personal pro preference obviously with lipstick and lipstick comes in and out of fashion but I personally do think that very matte lips um very matte lipstick can make your lips appear a bit dry and also a little bit sort of flattening deadening um and can emphasize any flakiness that that we have um matte colors sort of absorb the light whereas I prefer a slightly glossy or slightly more hydrated, not, not super, super glossy, but just that, that bit of sheen on my lipstick, um, because that makes sure I think it makes your lips look really sort of fresh and, and, and bright um, because it reflects off the light and therefore can also make your, make your lips appear a little bit fuller. I mean, even if I'm wearing, um, I'm wearing poppy today, I'm, I'm just going to demonstrate putting a little bit of gloss, a bit more gloss, uh, this is just the clear gloss, just in the set in the middle area. And I would already think that my face looks a little bit more sort of fresh and bright. So um, it is a personal pre preference. I particularly do love the Look Fabulous Forever lipsticks because they are not totally matte at all um, and therefore not drying. Um, and if I want an even extra bit, I would add a bit of gloss. And I'm using this because if you just, if you're using the clear gloss, and you apply it to a red lipstick and then you put it back in the um, tube, it will change the shape, the color of the gloss. If you want to keep your clear gloss completely clear, put it on your hand and just use a lip brush to apply it. And then you won't transfer the color back into your clear gloss um, into this. So it stays clear. So then you can use it on all different color lipsticks. So yes, I definitely personally don't like a really, really matte look, but it's, it is personal preference. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Sally. Um, a couple of things on what Sally just said. When you uh, apply your lip primer, they, that also has an integrated sponge applicator. I have got into the habit of dabbing. So once I apply it around my mouth, which has got a little bit of um, foundation, you know, that I've, I've put on, it transfers to the applicator, the foundation, put it back into the lip primer, which is white, and it gradually over time turns it brown and it looks horrible. So I've taken to wiping that um, sponge applicator before I put it back in. Um, it just keeps the product kind of uh, cleaner um, and it doesn't mix the, mix the two together. It looks a lot nicer as well. So that's a tip there. It's a similar thing to Sally was saying. And I just to say about my lipstick looks more matte than Sally's. And I'm finding with the lip pencils, so this morning I put the raspberry, I think it was the raspberry lip pencil on, uh, first and then colored it in and then when I put the Monroe red on top actually it mattifies it slightly mm -hmm. so if you do like us and I haven't put the lip gloss on so if you do like a slightly more matte look that is one way to get it and I, I quite like this Monroe red because it seems because I've got the lip primer on I think it's making the color um, a bit more dense which is quite nice and uh, it's special look, special evening look and so on and so forth. So that is one way to, to, to create a slightly more mattified look. I, I know there's, um, there's, I think Mac, uh, I don't know what the other brands, I'm sure they all do them, but make uh, some really, really, you know, lovely matte colors, which look terrific on young lips. I think there's a bit of a more of a problem with an older face that, um, you know, matte tends to, I don't know, kind of be, be slightly deadening and and you on your lips anyway. So maybe that, you know, little bit of shine uh, brings them to life a bit more. But it's personal, as Sally said, it's a personal choice. If you like that look um, then and it suits you and you all know that because you look in the mirror and see that it suits you, then uh, obviously go for it big time. I think we're at the end there now. Um, our hour is up. Gosh, that was good timing. Um, so obviously, as always, we say, uh, Thank you, Sister Sally. Um, have you got your glass ready, Sally? Not only are we looking ridiculously dressed up at you know, 11 o'clock, <laughs> we're, 
we're already on the drink. So uh, we thought, uh, I don't have fizzy stuff. I've actually just got a glass of wine. But we wanted to raise a toast to you all, ladies. We couldn't, you know, if you weren't there, there'd be no point in doing this. As I said before, we would literally be shouting into the void and we, we wouldn't want to do that, would we? So awesome. thank you so much for your company this time and all the times throughout the year. Um, we love doing these sessions. We think they are, they're the best thing uh, that, we, that we do in lots of ways, Sally and I, because uh, they're so enjoyable. And we love the feedback that we get and the appreciation we get from all of you. Uh, Doreen, I'm so full of admiration that you got up at five o'clock this morning <laughs> in America to watch this. How brilliant is it that we live in a world where somebody in America can get up at five o'clock and join us? Uh, it's delightful to have your company. It's, it's delightful to have everybody's company. And Sally and I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a very, very, very happy Christmas. Uh, wherever you are, with whom you uh, spend it. And um, yes, cheers, everybody. Thank you. And uh, here's to a great 2023. Oh, my God. Yes, thank you, everyone. Happy Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.